Welcome to the Electric Playground. Today on the show, we take a ride with Mario in the rundown. Plus, Vic gets a very up close and inky look at the multiplayer in Splatoon. And then Steven Raju come home with a review of the PC game Grow Home. Also coming up, Steven Raju wrap the new Apple Watch around their wrists. We take a look back at some classic Spider-Man action and much more today on EP Daily. Brought to you by EB Games. I'm your host, Victor Lucas, bringing you the latest in everything cool every single day. And the best part of any reality, virtual or otherwise, is a little thing we like to call the rundown. It looks like 2016 might be the year of virtual reality. The highly anticipated VR headset, the Oculus Rift, will finally hit stores early next year. This might come as a bit of a disappointment for those who were hoping the Rift would be out before the end of this year. And this means it will launch around the same time that Sony and other rival tech companies are expected to release their own VR headsets. The developers hope VR will revolutionize gaming and also transform the way we watch movies and TV, browse the web, and communicate with one another. Basically, you'll be able to live inside your headset and never leave your house. The biggest question that has yet to be answered is how much will the device cost? Expect a sticker price to be revealed in the coming months. Oh my God. Get ready to take a trip to a real life version of the Mushroom Kingdom. Nintendo and Universal Studios are joining forces to create theme park attractions based on Nintendo's most iconic games and characters. The deal will include major attractions at Universal parks and resorts all over the world with all the characters and worlds from the vast Nintendo library up for grabs. They haven't said exactly what those major attractions will be, but they could include rides, 4D presentations, walk-through worlds, or live stage shows. We've got our fingers crossed for a Mario Kart ride and a DK Jungle Cruise. The deal is still in its early stages, so don't expect to see the first Nintendo attractions at Universal Parks for at least another few years. Some fun stories to talk about in the rundown today. Here to help me talk about them is my fun pal, Mr. Scott C. Jones. Yeah, these are very fun topics. And Nintendo is uh, getting into the theme park business. Yes. I think there's a big finally after that statement, right? I think so, too. You know, I thought a lot about the last couple of Mario games. Yeah. And they really haven't, I mean, they really haven't gone anywhere since Galaxy. Mm -hmm. I just feel like they've kind of leveled off and turning all of the stuff from the Nintendo properties into theme park attractions, like that's very interesting to me. You know? Well, these are uh, incredibly enormous properties, arguably some of the most famous characters and worlds that uh, we have in popular fiction right now. What about and, a high rule? I know, and it's always been an incredibly attractive idea to game enthusiasts like us to kind of imagine that one day we would finally get to walk around in these things. You just want to go there and collect all the collectible things. And I, well, and that's also the other big part of it. It's clear to me that Nintendo is taking, uh, you know, licensing in a whole different way these days. They're starting to understand all of the different ways that they can diverge from their core game uh, sort of business, I think it's going to be very exciting, and they're doing lots of really cool things there, so thumbs up, Nintendo. Now, Oculus Rift, we've got a release date that uh, has finally been announced. It's still a little bit vague. We don't know the price. We don't know exactly when we're going to be able to get this thing. Yeah, and you know what? I think I'm a little, I've been a little worried about VR for, for a while now, even though you go to trade shows like the Game Developers Conference recently, yeah. and there's lots of VR on the show floor, but I, I started to worry about it in the same way, and it's kind of a, a neuroses that developed around Google Glass. Yeah. Like Google Glass never came to fruition, all those photos of people wearing it. And, and VR looks like they, they've staked the claim. It's all coming out, it's all coming at us. Uh, I, I don't know how, if how this is gonna you know bear out. I don't know what the fruits of it are going to be. It's interesting. It's something I definitely want to keep an eye on. Our hair is just gonna get destroyed <laughs> through all of this. Maybe just uh, we just, uh, just zip it right off, right on the show, January one, the right. year of VR. The year of VR. Let us, and go bald. Let us assimilate, yes. and we'll put on. <laughs> That's exciting. I think people would like to see that, that for sure. Be, that would be fun. No, I think that uh, you know the the potential for VR has a long way to go, and it will be exciting days. I'm also incredibly excited about what uh, is happening with HoloLens. I think the idea of manipulating things in space like that sounds really cool. But we won't need VR for Splatoon, which is coming up soon. Here's a look at the multiplayer. We 
are talking about multiplayer in Splatoon, which is the core part of the game. Did it start as a multiplayer kind of idea? They really were experimenting with how they wanted that squad-based combat to go. They wanted something completely new and fresh, though, so it's not just team deathmatch situation. You really want to just cover as much ink as possible in the turf war mode. Cynically, you could look at this game and you could say, well, is Nintendo just trying to get in on the shooter business? but I don't think that's how Nintendo thinks about games, right? We certainly are aware of the genre, but we're not looking to replicate or necessarily follow the trends of any other shooters. But I think once people play, they'll notice a lot of stark differences. I mean, even with the gamepad controller, you've got a lot of great uses that has in gameplays. Uh, shooting ink as your main weapon, you've got ink rollers, which have never been in a game before, to my knowledge. Yeah. And you're just running around with an ink roller covering territory. Yes! Let's get into some of the subtleties and the variances in the multiplayer modes. We played Turf War at E3 last year, and that's whoever paints the most territory wins. What else are you going to be able to do in multiplayer? Turf War is that bread and butter. That's going to be the main mode that yeah. uh, people are going to play for the first time. There is another mode called Ranked Battle. Now, this is specifically for more of a skilled core audience. It's not going to be available at launch. Once you level up to level 10, mm -hmm. you'll be able to start playing Ranked Battles. And and once we kind of at Nintendo notice enough people are level 10, we'll open this mode up. One of the modes we're showing here today is called Splat Zones, where you're trying to take control of a specific territory, hold it for as long as you can. If your counter can reach zero, you'll win the match. It requires a lot more teamwork coordination. Yeah. If you try to be that solo cowboy and go in, you're not gonna have a chance. Now you have weapons, they're projectile weapons, you can take your enemies out with them, but there are mechanics at play here that people have never experienced before. Give us some pro tips on how you do well at Splatoon. Yeah, so I mean, the one that a lot of people are gonna be familiar with that have seen the game at E3 is the splatter shot. That's kind of that rapid fire weapon that just splatters ink at a rapid fire rate. Yeah. One of them is called the splat roller. It looks like a paint roller and you can just hold down the fire button and you're just rolling ink all around the ground. You feel so powerful at the same time so vulnerable. Another one is called the Splat Charger. It's more of a long-range rifle that you're able to uh, kind of snipe people with. Yeah. The great thing about the Splat Charger is you can hold down to fire and it kind of fires this like straight line that you can then turn into a squid and kind of swim across really quickly. So each weapon comes with its own strengths and weaknesses. One of the cool subtleties in the game is that you go into the squid mode and you're automatically moving a lot quicker. The better players are definitely going to be using the squid form to their advantage. So as soon as you spray down ink in your color, that's how you're going to move quickly. There's no run button, so you want to spray that ink down, swim in your ink. You can spray the walls and even like swim up the walls to get maybe to a higher perch where you might be able to snipe or throw bombs down. Yeah. If you're not switching back and forth strategically with your squid button, you're probably going to be at a disadvantage. All right, tell me the truth. The first time that you saw this, was it called Splatoon? And did you think that everybody was a bit crazy? The first time I saw this, it was called Splatoon, and I did think everybody was crazy, but once I got my hands on it, they had to basically wrestle the gamepad away from me because, again, every time you play, even if you're losing, you just want that one more match. Maybe you want to change your weapon up, but it's just really refreshing. Interesting, interesting. Looks like a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. Nintendo is very serious about Splatoon. It's hitting the Wii U hard on May 29th. And stick around when we come back. Steve and Raju are reviewing Grow Home. Don't go away. EP's mobile coverage is brought to you by GameLock, makers of Dungeon Hunter 5, which you can play for free on iOS and Android right now. What up, homies? Do you like weddings? I do too, but I always have this fantasy that maybe one wedding that I go to, the bride will run out or the groom will run out, and then it'll just be drama. I've never seen that in real life, but I've seen that in a video game. It's called Wedding Escape. This looks like a match three, and I suppose you could call it a match three, but it's a little bit different because what you're doing is flipping coins and tiles to match up in a row. Yes, you've seen this kind of gameplay before. And yes, this game is free with many of the freemium tropes because what you want to do is continue on. You need to continue fleeing. So that's what I do love about this game is watching the little groom or the bride run away at the top of your screen. You need to progress to each level. And what you want to do is get this bride or groom away. You just want to get them off into an airplane to fly far, far away from the priest that's chasing them or the bridesmaids chasing them with their bouquet. Ah! 
It's really cute animation, but it is a freemium game that you will get sick of after a week. I can promise you that. I'm giving Wedding Escape a 7 out of 10. Wedding Escape is behind us, and you know, another reason I picked that game is because it reminds me of a Taylor Swift song. Everything really reminds you of a Taylor Swift song. Yeah. Moving right along, now two men who are about as old as the Ents in Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings are here. Oh, mean. Here's Steven Raju with their review of Grow Home. It takes a long time to review a game when you're Steven Raju. We all know our friends at Ubisoft are all about the big franchises, the Assassin's Creed's, the Rainbow Sixes, but they also dabble in the smaller stuff as well. And today we're looking at just such a game. This is Grow Home. It's developed by Ubisoft Reflections, the guys who made the Driver series. And it's kind of weird, because this is nothing like Driver. This is basically a giant space plant growing... Robotic Jack and the Beanstalk. There you go. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> you should have just done that, that because is, that is the best way to describe this that game. That is exactly what this game is. Now, you know, I think this is really interesting where this game started from. Honestly, it was an animation test that they really kind of liked, and then inside of a month, they just sort of plowed through the development and then put up online, and you can see some of those rough around there the edges, rough edges. Bits, despite the fact that it's actually really pretty. Yeah. It's really beautiful, and so basically you play as a guy called Bud, a botanical utility droid. Isn't that clever? <laughs> yes, Isn't Bud. That precious? And so basically he has to climb up this giant star plant and get ever going higher and higher. Now, the thing is, is that he has to find these branches and then ride them into sort of floating aisles, which I have to admit, it's a little phallic. Dude, <laughs> I'm glad you said that. This is literally the most phallic video game I've ever seen in my life. The star plant itself is basically a giant... What, Steve? What? <laughs> I mean, look at the tip of the thing. I'm not, I'm not really getting well, the anatomy of it. Is. It's a giant, you have to basically make your giant member grow as big as possible. I'm like, hey. And then not only that, you're riding, my life. The ride, you're riding the branches and trying to aiming over it. You're trying to like, penetrate yes. the energy rocks with your, anyway. So, okay. I don't even, like, I want to think it's not intentional, but come on. It's totally, it's There are so be, many okay? penises in this game. It's like <laughs> penis world. Like, that could be the name. Forget grow home, penis world. Okay, that out of the way. <laughs> I think that your real enjoyment of this game comes down to how much you can stand the controls. So basically, first off, the way that Bud runs, it looks like little ragdoll physics. Like his legs are sort of faster than he is. And then... I love that. He's kind of like stumbling. He runs like I do. I found that annoying. He can't quite get anywhere. So then the other thing is, is that in terms of the climbing, it's a lot like Quap. It's not as bad as Quap. You have to use either the triggers or the bumpers to sort of climb left hand, right hand, keep you know going up. And so it's this rock climbing game. It's very easy to fall off. And that's the other thing about this game. Invariably, like there are sort of teleportation pads that you have to activate and that'll get, that's your last checkpoint. But the checkpoints are really far apart. So you're gonna find, you're gonna fall off a ton of times. I know, I fell a little bit in the early going, but I found once I got the handle on how Bud moves, like he really does, he's all over the place. But his hands, you just gotta know that your hands will stick to anything. So as long as you're using the left and the right triggers or bumpers to grab stuff, you're okay. Like, so you grab the head of the space penis and ride it to the, the energy rock to make the, the bigger space penis grow higher. You know I'm a big fan of Minecraft, and this is not Minecraft-esque, but I will say it's kind of got that same sort of sense of relaxing whimsy and color and exploration to it. Well, the world is really, really pretty. I loved finding little bits of caves and stuff like that. I do think it's a little samey. I think that it, it is a lush world, but it's a little empty. It is, but it, I mean, that is what you make it. You grow your giant space penis plant higher and higher and, and get to these like new islands. There's like islands with waterfalls, there's islands yeah, with caves. Yeah. Every time you explore a new place, mom, that's your, I can't, what does mom stand I can't for? Remember I can't remember what mom stands for. She's like your AI overlord or whatever. And what I love about mom is like, when you screw up, she says, oh, you're doing a good job, bud. It's like, when you fall to your death, <laughs> you're doing a good job. Or you get like swallowed up by like this Venus fly trap. Oh, bud, you're doing a good job. It's like a real mom who encourages you when you're actually messing up all the time. I think I found this game a little more charming than you did, so I'm curious, what are you going to give Grow Home? I definitely like some aspects, but six and a half for me. Oh, for me, it's a solid eight out of 10. I love my giant space penises. Interesting, interesting. A little behind the scenes stuff for you. The two men went shopping for orthopedic shoes afterwards. No. That's right, true, true. They did not. They went shopping for Apple Watches, which they will review after this.
Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions. It was created by Beanox, which is a company based out of Quebec, and they killed it. Because it's one of our favorite superhero video games of all time. In fact, I would say that if Batman Arkham games didn't blow our minds, this would be right up there at the top. Something's not right. You play as four different Spider-Men in this game. You play as a futuristic Spider-Man, you play as a noir one, oh! you play as traditional comic booky one, ah! and you get to go through all of these different stages of Spider-Man throughout history and throughout time and different dimensions. So you're bouncing back and forth through these different realities and it changes up the mechanics and that's where the freshness lies. You've got all kinds of great first person in combat situations, excellent voice work. Woo! You got Spider-Man! A great script by Dan Slott, who's one of the best Spider-Man writers out there. If they've seen your show, they'll understand. This was a masterpiece. You definitely need to get this into your collection. Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions, an excellent buried treasure. See ya! Spider-Man! Oh man, why can't I have a wash that shoots out web slingers? So maybe bros would really think twice before they come at me. Maybe that'll be part of the Apple Watch 2.0, but for now, let's hear from our tech experts on the Apple Watch. The company has been calling it the most personal device they have ever made. Today, we are wearing them. We are reviewing the Apple Watch. There are so many expectations on this device. One, can it actually make wearables a thing? <laughs> Two, can it make a smartwatch a thing that we actually like and want to use and care about? And three, Jeebus, it costs a lot. <laughs> Can they make this? Is this something that you should justify as a purchase? Man, I'm not sure we're really quite there with smartwatches in general. I don't know if anybody really wants or needs a smartwatch, but you gotta give it to Apple. When they throw in behind something, you know, whether it's the smartphone or the personal computer or whatever, you know it has a good chance of taking off. Now, We've been wearing these things for a few weeks now. Mm -hmm. I gotta say, given that the Apple Watch starts at around 500 bucks, I don't know if I wanna pay 500 bucks. For me, is essentially a thing that tells me when I have messages, because that is the primary use. It's got, I got a lot of apps in this thing. I got games, I got fitness stuff. Basically, it tells me when I have a WhatsApp. I think the first big thing you have to address with this is that, you know, Apple used to be the company where things just work. This is one of their first products where you are gonna have to put in the work to make it work for you. So in the first couple of days, I found it really sort of confusing and almost annoying, notifications buzzing all the time and sort of just trying stuff out. And I'm finding that it's getting better as I'm taking stuff off of it. Email notifications are gone. That's something that just works so much better on my phone and it just belongs there. That's the thing with the watch though. Literally, well, maybe not literally, almost anything you can do with the Apple Watch, you can do with your phone and do better. Yes. So Apple is trying to tell people, look, this is not meant to replace your iPhone. It's meant to be an extension of your iPhone. It's meant to give you sort of quick glances at information that you use every day which it does, it is good at that. I'm just not sure if that is really enough to motivate people to adopt wearables. I mean, the things I like about this, other than the fact that I get message notifications right to my wrist, I like the fitness aspects to it. I like the fact that it tracks my activity, tracks how much I'm standing and moving around. I, I think mean, that's useless. I, okay, not the standing. I get to turn off the standing reminder. I'm like, standing don't reminder, tell me yes. to stand up every hour. But I do like, you know, when I work out of it, I get I like literally an achievement for it. It gives me a little award on the screen. Congratulations for completing your exercises today, Steve. Here are the things that I really like about it. It's a really good watch. It looks really nice. It looks okay. I like the watch face. It looks really good for a smartwatch. Come on. It looks really good for, uh, come on. I really, I think it's fine, I think it's sexy, it's a good watch. Mm. I do like being able to change the wash faces. I think texting is awesome on this, and it's not texting, it's dictation. Some of the bite-sized apps are fabulous. Uh, you know, I checked my, my bank balance this morning really yeah. quick, I got paid, I really yeah. like that. I paid at Starbucks with it, and yeah. honestly, in the morning, I'm, you know, I'm all gangly, it's like, yeah, here you go, I like that. Honestly, this is gonna sound like such a first world complaint, there's too much swiping and tapping for a number of things, like you know, dismissing emails and it takes to get rid of stuff yeah. like that. I really don't like that. The apps need to grow into the watch. The, the technology is sound, it is a nice watch. It's, uh, the screen is amazing. It's a beautiful device in that respect. I think right now the first wave of apps we're seeing aren't quite taking advantage of what the watch could do. But I came into this with, I think, more expectations than the watch is delivering. Like, looking at photos is really terrible. There's no pinch to zoom. There's a minimal level of zoom. Instagram is junk on Instagram's it. Instagram's terrible. There's no video playback when people say, well, why do you want a video playback on your watch? You know what? Because I'm wearing a freaking $500 computer on my wrist, and I think it would be cool to have videos on it. That's what I want. I don't care if it's not what Apple envisions for the watch. It's what I, the user, want. And until stuff like that starts to happen, it's just, I don't know, it's just, it's a toy. It's more of a toy than a necessity. Absolutely. First off, it's not a necessity. I 
I, you know, I think the knocks, are, you know, I have to say is, is that it is way overpriced. I think what they're asking oh. for the bands, the bands is outrageous. They are defining a category. I think that part of the issue is our expectations and what we expect of them. And I think that, you know, one of the big things is this thing does not make a very good first impression. No. You know, it's not as intuitive as I've come to expect from exactly. this company. I'm very, very curious. Mr. Tilly, what are you going to give the Apple Watch? As the Apple Watch exists right now, I'm only going to give it a 6.5. I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10. Well, yes, I have priced out my own Apple Watch, and Victor, I'm not really sure when the best time is to ask for a raise, but my wrist is getting cold, you feel me? Don't go anywhere, we have the Twitter question of the day coming up next. If you want more EP, go to our website, epn.tv, for bonus content and full episodes. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to EP Daily. It is time now for the Twitter question of the day. Mm -hmm. Today's question comes from Michael Finlay's son. He is at Picaroonie. Can't <laughs> find your review of Avengers 2. Do I suck at the internet? Victor well, Lucas? We don't want to say suck, but there are multiple ways to watch our review of Avengers 2 and all the other cool things that we uh, create on this show. Uh, head to epn.tv. That's our mothership website. Okay. But we're also posting a lot of stuff on Facebook these days okay. and on YouTube. Uh, there are lots of ways that you can watch us. Can I find some of the videos from when you were a gambling degenerate? Uh, no, I, I buried and you went those. Through, like the intervention internet? I, I buried all Can't those. Can't find those? I buried all those, but maybe you can find them if you dig around on EPN.TV. And listen, we're already cooking some new stories for you. In fact, we've got something very cool on season two of Star Wars Rebels. See you tomorrow. Thanks for watching. EP would like to thank its sponsors, Nintendo, Xbox. We saw where he started at the beginning of season one. He was the streetwise kid who was very self-reliant, did everything on his own, and then came and met the Rebels, and that's where we started the show. And he learned how to grow with these innate abilities that he had. He's learned to harness them, and he gets a lightsaber, and he has a teacher, and things are progressing very quickly.